talk about is zoonotic diseases or zoonoses. And, uh, and I sort of start with this question of, can my animals make me sick? And uh, I think as we, we talk to the public, hopefully you all know that this is true, that they can make you sick and or the bugs they carry can make you sick. Um, and so I think this is a good, um, a good uh, lead in to our, our discussion. So it's not just livestock. Um, we also have some issues that arise with companion animals. This is a 2009 article from the AP that was, I believe, in the uh, Salt Lake Tribune. And this talks about how the new Ochre Lake area, which is, uh, I think it's Daybreak is the subdivision in the south end of the Salt Lake Valley over by Harriman in that area that they had put this uh, lake in and evidently some people had been infected with some, um, some uh, visceral or cutaneous larval migrans from roundworm infections where the worms sort of burrow into the skin and give them problems with, uh, with the migrans. So I think that, that, that when we talk about are getting sick from animals or worrying about these diseases that can be transmitted from animals to humans. We can't forget, we always want to go right to livestock. Everybody wants to run right to livestock, but we can't forget about some of our companion animals and the concerns that we might have with them. Here are some of the enteric diseases associated with animals. And enteric diseases mean those diseases that can cause diarrhea in humans. And uh, here are some uh, reported outbreaks of the summary between uh, 91 and 2005, and it sees the predominant seems to be um, associated with E. coli and Salmonella. Um, and so when we look at, uh, excuse me, with um, E. coli and Salmonella, yeah. So when we look at uh, outbreaks of diseases that cause diarrhea, those are the most common that we sort of look at. We can also have Campylobacter and Cryptosporidium and Giardia, and, and uh, there can be uh, instances where a number of bugs can cause uh, uh, diarrhea in humans that they can get from animals. Carrie, are, are these statistics from Utah um, Health Department? Is, that, is this just in Utah? These no, this, this is actually a summary statistic from here in the United States. Okay. And so uh, this is actually from the the CDC, and it was at, it was actually a specific kind of outbreak, enteric diseases. This doesn't report, you know, respiratory diseases and other types of diseases that we can get from animals. Good question. So animal contact outbreaks in the United States. This is some more recent data. We've got uh, on the lower left. This is contact outbreaks in the United States associated with animals. In humans, this is some summary from 96 to uh, 2012. We see the cases there, and you can see then E. coli and Salmonella um, rise to the top, as well as Crypto and Campylobacter. Now, you may not be familiar with all of these pathogens. Suffice it to say, you don't need to be, other than knowing that uh, these pathogens can be um, um, carried by animals can be found in animals. And we'll talk a little bit about routes of transmission. And then we look on the other side on the right, we see that uh, by year, greater than 4,000 uh, illnesses associated with animal contact outbreaks in the United States, as well as uh, over 500 people are hospitalized um, each year when we look at that summary. And I think maybe if I wanna use my, my X-ray vision here, put on my epi hat, I think that looks like an upward trend. And there's been a lot of discussion about, do we see more and more of these outbreaks? Noth there's been no silver bullet found or smoking gun or whatever other analogy you wanna use that tells us why that might be the case. But my gut is telling me, and I think some other people have theorized that as we are further and further removed from agriculture as a society, you know, I mean, just way under 5% of our population works with directly with agriculture, then we have a population that might be naive either to precautionary steps when you work with animals or maybe their immune systems are a little bit more naive to some of these things. So I don't know what your theories are, but that sort of, um, I seem to see this upward 
um, trend with uh, diseases associated with animal contact. Here is some uh, in US agricultural fairs, and this is out of some data out of uh, Scotland that showed that uh, 29 um, of 32 fairs had salmonella when they went and looked at the when they went and looked at the environment as well as the livestock. And 91% or excuse me, 19% of the livestock that they uh, that they went and tested uh, were carriers for salmonella. And then you can see some similar numbers with E. coli there on the left side. So it's kind of interesting that they're finding then when we go to fairs or these um, agricultural exhibits with animals that you can find salmonella in E. coli. And particularly the E. coli that produces that shiga toxin that everybody worries about that 0157. So um, just some alarming data that, that, but I think we knew that, that animals do have salmonella and E. coli as well as humans can have salmonella and E. coli as well. And maybe they clinically don't show that they're sick, but yet they might be carriers or asymptomatic um, with the disease. In Utah, last year, towards the end, um, health officials became a little bit concerned when there seemed to be an uptick in um, um, shiga toxin E. coli um, associated with um, humans that may have come into contact in petting zoos, corn mazes, and farms that had some livestock. Um, that were there. And so this sort of prompted the discussion with, uh, with the health department and Department of Agriculture and Foods with myself to say, what can we do to sort of look at this? If we're having a slight uptake here, might be associated, might not be. We, we certainly aren't pointing fingers at agriculture, but can we do some education and awareness? And so I think that that sort of leads us then into our next part of discussion. But let me provide a little bit more background there are some common transmission routes when we look at uh, when we look at agricultural diseases from animals um, showing up in humans. This upper right picture is shows the dust that might be inside of a shed or a barn. And I know that Dr. Frames on the call, and if we were to see sometimes that turkey dust that's associated with uh, with raising uh, poultry or turkeys in that and this specific instance, it would be really dusty as well. Although they've got great ventilation, but uh, you can still be exposed to quite a bit of dust. And then this is me on the lower left. I'm working some bowls. It's down by Levan, Utah. And uh, you can see if you look real hard that there's some manure on my face. And so this will lead us into some of these routes of transmission, this picture. So we can have direct or indirect transmission. And I think the picture down here really highlights direct transmission as well as indirect transmission. So we have one of the children there petting this calf, this Hereford looking calf, and uh, the tongue is licking the, the uh, hand of this individual. And so if that individual then takes that and goes right to its mouth, that's direct transmission. And indirect then would be this, uh, what appears to be maybe a girl, I don't know, another young child with their lips on the side of the gate here, then that would be indirect transmission. So in other words, uh, she's licking a, what we would call an inanimate object or a fomite in that situation. And there could be some um, bugs or some fecal material on that. Well, there likely is fecal material on that. And they, that potentially could be exposed. The most common route of transmission is fecal oral contamination. And this scenario plays out in a lot of the things that we do. And most of the time, it gets on your hands, hands to the mouth, hands to the eyes, you know, other uh, areas of entry as well. But uh, fecal oral contamination is very common. And when we look over at milk, um, as you milk the cow, you can see that uh, there could be some contamination on the hair of the cow or even on the teat ends, or even on this milker's hands that can get from the, uh, from the cow or the hands of that milker and fall into that milk that's uh, hitting that bucket. So that's a really common scenario when we talk about this transmission, it's fecal oral. 
So of course our prevention is straightforward. We wanna wash the hands. If uh, we wanna provide hand sanitizers, avoid eating in the barnyard, pasteurization of milk and other dairy products as well as other products such as honey and so is, is always recommended by uh, health officials. And we need to embrace inspection. And I wanna add a little bit of a slide on that as we go in. So washing hands, it can't be emphasized enough. Did you know that there's a global hand washing day? Well, that makes sense globally because I've taken some classes in public health that show that there are parts of the world that don't do a lot of hand washing. But here in the Utah, on the, on the lower left, the University of Utah has a hand washing education that they put out that uh, only 5% of people wash their hands correctly. And if I remember right, you're supposed to um, wash your hands with soap for at least 20 seconds. And I think that they have some jingle you're supposed to sort of hum or sing in their promotion and their education that they teach you. Um, but you're supposed to do that for 20 seconds and then uh, they, can, they show you some other things. But only 5% of people wash their hands correctly. I don't know if I'm, I'm not surprised that people don't wash their hands correctly. I'm surprised that 95% of people don't wash their hands correctly. Um, I'm not, uh, when I go back to, I'm not surprised that there are some people because anytime, and I don't want to get gross or crude here, but anytime you use the restroom, you can be using the restroom, you, somebody comes in and they leave and there's no hand washing that takes place. And so that makes you go, hmm. But uh, especially later when you see them in the hall, and they want to shake hands with you. The other thing is hand sanitizers. And these are really common. We see these at animal exhibits and fairs and, and anywhere that uh, these livestock, uh, petting zoos, those types of things where livestock is on display. And ha uh, hand sanitizers are actually fairly effective. And there, there's some fairly good research, I don't have it presented here, that, that shows that it can be very effective and in some cases as good as hand washing. Um, the main thing with hand sanitizers is we have to understand the mode of action. The common active ingredient is actually alcohol. And how alcohol works is as it evaporates, it desiccates or dries out the, uh, the, the virus or the, or the bacteria that might be on the hand and it kills them. So it, its action is through desiccation or it sort of dries them out, if you will, as it evaporates. And so if you're gonna use some hand cleaners, you're not gonna to wanna to offer paper towels near them because we don't want them to wipe the sanitizer off their hands after they put the sanitizer on. We actually want it to dry or evaporate off their hand and that's the effectiveness. The second point about hand sanitizers is if there's a lot of organic debris on the surface, then the hand sanitizer is not as effective getting into that organic debris. So we wanna get the bulk of the manure, the bulk of the mud or whatever's on the hands off and then use the hand sanitizer. And I think that's probably common sense, but it's, it's, uh, it's good for us to reinforce that. Now, another one is to avoid eating in the barnyard. And this is a common problem in the fair. Uh, fair areas, right? I mean, you'll have eating stands outside some, some um, you know, uh, wagon that you can get some food at. People are always walking through eating and that sort of thing. I don't know how you prevent that. It's sort of a big fair, but nonetheless, nonetheless, this is some common signage that you might see on the lower left that talks about not eating or drinking around exhibited livestock, particularly those babies with things like pacifiers. I mean, they'll fall out and and uh, get picked up and stuck right back in their mouth. And so this is to sort of prompt us to avoid eating in the barnyard. Now, pasteurization. There seems to be uh, uh, this movement that uh, non-pasteurized foods such as milk is, is better for you than pasteurized foods such as milk. And I think that the, the research just does not prove that out. And in fact, there's a really compelling argument that says that pasteurization does a great job of uh, eliminating some of these pathogens that might be in the milk, for example, or cheese, that happened to uh, get in, that fell off the cow or was introduced uh, some other way. And, and so pasteurization really 
has helped reduce enteric disease in the United States. However, in the lower left, you can see this map and more and more um, states are adopting legislation that allows um, raw milk cell within the state and to varying degrees and with some restrictions and certain policy. But it looks like the majority now have some sort of regulated sale of raw milk. And, uh, and so we're, and as a result, I think we're seeing more and more of these enteric outbreaks because of that. And I'll, I'll illustrate that with a database here in a, in a minute. Here this uh, uh, early spring, we had a, I guess it was late winter, we had uh, raw milk uh, brucellosis uh, linked to raw milk um, that hadn't been pasteurized. And this is an interesting um, case because they had, um, they had vaccinated some lactating dairy cattle with a vaccine. And the, as the way that vaccine works, it was actually shed in the milk and the milk was not pasteurized. And so people became in, infected with the, um, with the, bacteria that was actually used to vaccinate the cow to protect it. So this is a really interesting reason, it's sort of a unique scenario of a vaccinated cow and that's why I have it here. But pasteurization is important. Now why do I bring this in? Is because oftentimes when we have these um, exhibits for animals outside of maybe one of these state sanctioned shows or uh, fairs, we're going to see a lot of raw cells of food. And so we're gonna have farmer's markets and or some sort of a farm stand. And generally we're gonna see some maybe cheese or maybe some honey or even maybe some milk that's uh, offered for sale. So that's why I'm, I'm reinforcing this. Inspection's a good thing. Oftentimes we hear that just the, the horrible things with, that are involved with inspection. It's arduous, it's, it's rigorous, it's just unbearing, it's get the government out of my life. I ought to be able to eat and sell what I want, et cetera, et cetera. And you probably all heard these sort of arguments, but inspection actually has done a, some great things as we talk about food safety. And particularly they use these process called HACCP, which uses some statistical um, analysis to look at these critical control points. And if we can monitor, and if we can um, really highlight some critical control point, um, we can actually go spend a lot of money and effort in those areas and not as much in some of these less critical control points. And that's the whole basis of this. But I wanted to bring this in just to, to, to uh, reinforce that a lot of times when we have uh, these um, hobbyists or these people that are meeting niche markets, ha inspection and HACCP, it just, these are bitter swear words when, when we mention those in some gatherings. So again, here are our basic recommendations to, uh, to stop zoonotic diseases. We wanna have hand washing stations with signage that inc can include soap and water and hand sanitizers, no human food in the barnyard, and these people should embrace pasteurization and inspection if they, have, uh, if they, they sell in association with the exhibit or these uh, agro-tourism events that they, they sell these products. Now, this is going back to why do we care? Well, and why, why should we protect? First of all, there's a health concern. But second, I think we should protect, um, or we should do some education with those um, people, our constituents who are offering these, uh, these agro-tourism events. And that is, we just have a real litigious society. And I think the highlight of this was, remember the E. coli outbreak with um, uh, Jack in the Box back in the 90s. This law firm, Marler and Clark, you may not be aware, but they were the ones that uh, defended or um, in behalf started that class action lawsuit that brought all those people that were infected by, by Jack in the Box and then, then I, they got millions. Um, and unfortunately, there were some people that died and some people that have long-term care, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but what's interesting is this is what this law firm does now, full-time. They just work with food litigation. They keep an interesting um, database. So if we click on this database, um, can somebody tell me if they see this? Because it clicked on uh, another. I just want to know if you can see this as I'm sharing it. 
I, I can't see it. You can't see it. Perfect. So I'll hit, let's see, I think I've got to do this, stop sharing, and then I'm going to share again somehow. All right, can you see that now? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, so if we take a look at this uh, website, and this is maintained again by this law firm, and let's say, what food, uh, what are you interested in here? Well, let's just look at Utah. What food outbreak, related uh, outbreak of disease do we have in humans? We're gonna put the state in as Utah, if you've seen uh, me do that there. And we're gonna hit search. And this pulls up that uh, last year we had a multi-state outbreak of salmonella in, uh, it looks like some beef. Here's some E. coli that was linked to romaine lettuce. Kellogg honey snacks, honey smack cereal, and it goes on and on. But what's interesting is we had backyard flocks, um, raw turkey, um, et cetera. So that's kind of interesting of what's directly affecting Utah. But what if we stick, let's bring Utah off and let's go up here to look at, uh, we'll take all this, we'll, we'll include all the states and let's put in petting zoo. Let's see who's associated with petting zoos. Well, here we go. Looks like last November of 2018, there was a cracker barrel. This must be some sort of a rural thing up in that community associated with an outbreak. Uh, oh, this is funny. So we have a botulism linked to illicit alcohol in a correctional facility. I don't know why, you know, I don't know why, uh, petting zoo showed up here, but I, really, I, I remember clicking on this one. The inmates were making some hat, homemade hooch in their uh, cells by fermenting some food, and anyway, they, were, they got caught. But here, if we go back to uh, September 2015, a big outbreak in a fair in um, Maine of E. coli. You can keep going down in North Dakota, Michigan, et cetera, et cetera, and I don't need to read these all to you, but, but we've had some significant outbreaks and what should be alarming if we're not alarmed just from that public health concern, but we've got a legal firm, a law firm that tracks these. And I guess maybe looking to defend uh, these people should they become ill. So I think that points to another argument of why we should protect then those constituents we might have that uh, do exhibits that involve animals. Let me uh, stop the share and we'll go back to the PowerPoint here. Let's hit that and hit share. Now, can you see that? Yep, looks good. Perfect, thank you, Dave. So uh, uh, that was the point there. At Utah State University, as a result of that uh, outbreak with E. coli cases, um, we approached uh, the Department of Agriculture and Foods in Utah, as well as the Department of Health. We pulled uh, an effort, a team together to, to sort of look at this. We, there are a couple of questions that we, we have and a couple of concerns. First of all, we're unaware of any significant extension and outreach or programming from either Department of Food and Agriculture, USU Extension, or Department of Health that targets these agro-tourism events um, as it relates to some of these disease preventing things. We do, however, USU has had some extension effort into sort of using some, um, you know, on the economic side, helping farms diversify, right? And find niche markets. But, but there's nowhere that they have to be registered. There's nowhere that these people, um, really have to do anything to, uh, to open up some sort of a petting zoo and put four goats out for people to pet when they come. And so I'm not saying that that's wrong. What I'm saying is we just don't know who these individuals are. So our first objective is to identify who our agro or agritourism operations are in Utah. We've got, you know, we, we've got some lists, et cetera, uh, but they're just incomplete. And we're unaware of anybody doing a real concerted effort to um, serve this population of, of uh, our constituents. And then we, we've 
we're creating an anonymous survey to look at what they're currently doing in terms of zoonotic disease. That's my twist. Others in the team have uh, different objectives. And then we want to develop some education and outreach programming to help so that we don't have this reoccurrence um, like we had last fall. But here's where we need you. So I need you to help me. And what we need is uh, we need to know who these people are. And so in your county and the people you work with, who's got a corn maze? Who's got a pumpkin patch? Who's got a, a whatever else that they might have for agritourism? The other day I saw a big water slide at a farm that uh, some people were using. We want them all. They don't have to necessarily have animals because you may not know that they have animals. And so we'll reach out, and we'll let the survey sort of dig in um, and, and tease that type of information out. But this is where we need your help. And so if you could contact me, um, we'll also do a more formal uh, invite to participate. So we're giving you a heads up that uh, we'd like to have your help in getting this survey out there and identifying these people so that uh, we can help develop some extension programming. So that concludes my presentation today and, and I thank you.